Hello, and welcome to a special report on METV. I'm Charles Clapsaddle, Station Manager for Manatee Educational Television. And on this special report, we're talking about an issue that not only affects the nation, the state, and this region, but also our community. And we're talking about human trafficking. And joining us today are three ladies who are going to talk about one organization that's really making a difference in our community, and that's Sale of Freedom. Joining us today is Elizabeth Menendez, <laughs> how are you, Fisher, and Kinsey Neeson and Connie Rose. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us today and talking about what I consider a very important organization that's really making a difference in our community. Now, Elizabeth, you're the president and CEO of Sale of Freedom. Tell us, first of all, about what Sale of Freedom is and its origins. Okay. Well, basically, we're an organization that not only brings awareness to the issue, as you know, it's come to the light a lot in the last three years. Absolutely. Um, but we bring solutions. And I have my three, you know, the three of us are pretty much an anchor part of the organization, so we'll share more. Mm -hmm. um, really came to be because truly there was a need. We weren't looking to create another organization in any way, shape, or form. Um, we were doing an event that literally just wanted to hold up an underdog charity. Mm -hmm. I had just moved from Chicago a few years back mm -hmm. and didn't, wasn't familiar with the area that well. And so people on the leadership team, we had a leadership team of um, some different organizations came together for the event and they said, you're new, just go ask people, what's happening here? Mm -hmm. what, is, what are people not talking about that needs attention? And when I was told, our own local children are being sold for sex, mm. and no one's really helping do anything about that, mm -hmm. we thought, we're done. We will find that charity, we'll raise that up, because that's a horrendous issue. And, and you know, let me just stop you yeah. briefly, because this has been an issue that's been ongoing throughout the country for a period of time. Mm -hmm. and, and it seems to me, and please correct me if yeah. I'm wrong, that it's kind of escalated, that human trafficking, sex slavery, has increased. And even though there's been a lot of attention paid to this, it's still a problem that's out there that needs to be remedied, needs to be stopped. Yeah, I think it's an issue. Like I always say, sin is old as time. I think it's been around forever. Mm -hmm. I think this label is new. So calling, because in other countries, human trafficking looks different. Mm -hmm. In America, what's defined as human trafficking is our, you know, what it looks like ma majority of the cases here are domestic, mm -hmm. especially in our area. It's domestic, our own local children. Mm. Um, so that, I think, is what's been shocking and raised to a level of awareness because I think people were turning a blind eye. Mm -hmm. to what they were seeing before. And now that they're realizing, you know, the backstory and what this really is, people want to do something about it. So Sale of Freedom, first of all, t tell us, you know, because it's a unique name, okay. and tell us, you know, the origins of Sela uh, yeah. to begin with. Um, the name Sela Freedom, Sela is a Hebrew word, and Hebrew word meaning to rest, to pause, to reflect. Huh. And so what we found with this population, because as we share more about who we serve, these girls that we serve have been on such an abuse cycle, such an abuse wheel, they've never been able to pause and reflect on the fact that this is not who they are, this is not who they're meant to be, and it doesn't define them. So we let them come to us and pause mm. as we walk them into freedom of what they were designed to be. And, and what an appropriate and beautiful and elegant name to do that. Uh, and, you know, and I want to take a moment and talk with Kinsey and, and, as, as well as Connie. Now, you're the director of law enforcement outreach and the liaison. Is that correct? Yes. I can only imagine that law enforcement plays such a vital role in the work that you continue to do. Yes. A lot of times they'll get... Um, the women or boys or girls, depending on who's being trafficked or who's being targeted, a lot of times they get caught up in the criminal justice system. And so it's important that law enforcement is aware of this, they have training, and they know what to do with these vulnerable population. Um, otherwise, they'll go into um, maybe a detox or a rehab right. facility where they're more likely to get exploited again and again. And, and, and we want to talk a little bit more about that. And Connie, you know, I, I, your position as the Director of Survivor Programming and Leadership has got to be a very difficult one because, you know, to say, dealing with the survivors of, of all of these things, uh, of, of these t tremendous crimes ha has got to be, you know, a, a, a tremendous amount of work to help these young people. You know, it is a tremendous amount of work, but it's also very rewarding. Mm -hmm. It is honoring, it's rewarding to be able to walk alongside a survivor 
whether it's a young girl, young boy, you know, woman, man, mm -hmm. and really watch that transformation with them. Mm -hmm. So for those very dark days that you're like, oh, you know, like, can I really do this one more time? Right. You just see that little light go off in their eye, and you know, like, oh, they're going to really make it. And I want to talk more about that, about, you know, some of the steps and, you know, the resources and services that you provide to help those people along their journey of recovery. But Elizabeth, you know, the question, you know, comes to mind is that, you know, how do you outreach to a community? This is, you know, a, 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 a behind the scenes, this is criminal activity that goes on. How do you reach out and find these you know, people and, and by finding them, be able to help them? How, how does that, how do you even begin to start on that? Right, I will, I will open this conversation, but I'm gonna kick it over to Kinsey in a moment because when we first started this, a really pinnacle piece of it was law enforcement mm -hmm. not saying not understanding and saying mm. this isn't a problem and this isn't happening here. So three mm. years ago, when this issue came to the light and we were finding a few survivors that were coming up because one of them is a county commissioner's grandniece and that was mm. the first one that came on the radar, mm. when she said to us, not only do I know this is an issue and I'm tired of hearing it's not, I'm gonna be a champion for you on it, um, we would still talk to law enforcement and they would say, no, we really don't have this issue here. And so the benefit, you know, we'll touch on this at some point, we came into a mentorship with the program. Mm -hmm. Law enforcement, um, National Rescue and FBI, when we first started learning right. about this, they said, two organizations in the country do this well, please don't try to make something up, please model after best practices. And so when I told the organization that we got into a mentorship with in Atlanta, that law enforcement was sort of not understanding, they flew in, not really? only one of their Rotary Club you know, leaders in their community of Atlanta, they flew in um, their district attorney. Wow. And the CEO of Wellspring came in and they did a five hour training hmm. with our law enforcement. First we did a round table, we invited business leaders, faith community, um, all our political you know, parties and everybody around the table to understand. And then they did a training. And that's when one law enforcement officer said, oh my gosh. Hmm. I have identified the last five cases wrong. Mm. I could have done this so much differently. And there was such humility that came over. And right around that time, Kinsey had earlier come onto our team with her master's in criminal justice. And so now she is a critical piece of how we keep training and equipping the law enforcement. But how critical was that to have that kind of partnership developed at the very beginning yeah. to say, hey, listen, here's information that we can provide you, how you best can identify the issue and the problem that's in your community right now. Right. Absolutely. So that had to be a valuable tool for you as well, Kinsey, is that correct? It was. That's what really opened the door and got our foot in the door with law enforcement and we were able to start trainings. And um, I think the beginning is really a buy-in. You know, people have to buy into that they believe this is happening here and start learning how it's happening here. Mm -hmm. And so locally, um, the police are having a huge prostitution problem. Um, from Bradenton to Sarasota. Mm -hmm. And so they're saying, hey, if you can help us with the prostitutes, we're listening. And so some trainings that right. we had received early on was it could take a year to build relationships um, with prostitutes because um, they're a vulnerable population. Mm -hmm. um, their backgrounds are they've been exploited or trafficked at some point. Right. And so we really needed to start figuring out where are these women going? Mm -hmm. A lot of them are homeless. So we need to make relationships with um, homeless organizations in the area, exactly. uh, the jail, a lot of them are going in and out of jail. Um, they might be told they have to go work so many hours and then they're getting caught by the police. So we really, it's a community issue. We had mm -hmm. to get everybody on board and then we started setting up um, and getting trained on different types of support groups mm -hmm. so that we could be in the community, in the jails, um, on focus groups in the community so we could really come together and all start to understand this issue. And, the, and to highlight, you know, to uh, the, those uh, resources and services that you can provide readily, mm -hmm. you know, and that, I think that's an important thing because there's this cycle that would go on. I, I would I would imagine you know in prostitution uh, you know, areas you know that there's this cycle of despair and being able to reach out and provide the resources and the services would be an invaluable contribution. And you know, can I say one thing? Absolutely. Cut in. Um, one thing that people say until I heard you say that I didn't mm. get it, and mm. I, I we haven't said that yet. Um, it's not about just a, a grown person that's a prostitute and we're trying to save their lives and it's not about somebody that right. was abducted and thrown into a truck. 
it's about the beginning and the origin, and I think it's important to sort of put that up in front. Well, and, and I think that's happened. really important because you know not only is your organization kind of outreach to the community a, a lot, but you know there seem. For general, when you hear human trafficking or sexual slavery, you know, people have a misunderstanding. They don't really understand right. the full gamut of this. And we're talking about, you know, the, the most heinous of crimes where people are subjugated to, you know, terrible, terrible conditions mm -hmm. uh, and at very young ages. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll let Connie speak more about this, but the, the true root of every client that we have worked with thus far, and this is in our region, and when we go up to Chicago and meet with people up there, it's what's happening in their region. So mm -hmm. it's pretty typical for domestic, for you know, the United States, what's happening and what we term human trafficking. But the person was someone that was sexually abused by someone they know at home, mm. through their school, through their church, mm. young as two, three, four years old. So that's who we're serving. We're serving that root of a child that was horrifically sexually abused, mm -hmm. continued for years and years and years, mm -hmm. to the point that in our program, we had one girl, typically they say it's 12 to 14 years old before they run away and can't take it anymore. Mm -hmm. One girl that was in our program said, I was 11 when I hit the streets in Bradenton because I said I would rather go on the streets than have mm -hmm. what happens in my bedroom happen any, every and, night. And, and, and you know, Again, you know, the hats off to all of you for you know the, for the efforts of this, because when you think about this, when you think about the ages uh, of some of these uh, uh, young girls and and women that are involved, uh, it's 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 a terrible terrible crime, and you know when by the time that they get out on the streets, sometimes it may be too late to help. And you know that's why organizations like yours are are so valuable. Mm -hmm. Now, Connie, have you seen a lot of you know uh, young girls out there that you know have no place to turn? And share the stats of what happens once they hit the street, how quickly? Right. So there's a lot. I mean, first of all, Florida has anywhere between thirty to forty thousand runaways on any given day. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Because one in three girls will be sexually violated before the age of eighteen, and mm -hmm. one in six boys. And those are the only the numbers that are re reported. And then why the runaway? Because just imagine, I, I can speak for myself, imagine having to be uh, sexually abused almost every day of your life mm. by someone that's supposed to be your caretaker. Mm. So your father, your mother, your preacher, your aunt, your uncle, your godfather, mm. your, you know, someone that you trust, right? And so what happens is, is that a lot of the survivors that we work with will say, it's so much better for me just to leave. If I go on the street, run away, go on the street, someone picks me up, I'm either having what's called survival sex, oh well, a, I was having sex anyway, mm. um, but whatever it is that they're doing is much better in their mind than being at home and, and being, basically being, and being raped being, every day of their them. life. And so, and then we go back to some of the other stats, and Elizabeth touched base on this, you know, that we go to that root, and that root is sexual abuse, but also the other component of that root is pornography. And so what happens is, you know, our girls and our boys come and they leave home and they've already been exposed to sex. They've already been exposed to pornography. They probably have participated in pornography. Mm. And then they're on the street and it's, they're so vulnerable. If mm. someone like, if we, organ, an organization like Sailor Freedom or any other organization doesn't step in, when, when a child leaves home, within 48 hours, they will be picked up. Mm. And they'll be exploited in some ways. And that looks, you know, all different ways, whether it's survival sex, whether it's, you know, just come stay with me for a little bit. I'll take mm -hmm. care of you. That turns around to do this for me in exchange. Mm -hmm. There's all different levels of that. Mm. And, and so that's what we have to really pay attention to and really, you know, gear into what are we going to do about this? Because it has now become a human rights issue and a social health issue epidemic and 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 I can see how that you know it kind of proliferates I mean you know from one wrong leads to another wrong mm -hmm. to another wrong and it's this continuation the cycle of of despair and hopelessness mm -hmm. really and you know again sale of freedom is being able to step in and make a difference but you can't do that you know however talented and, <laughs> and efficient and, and dedicated you are you can't do that by yourself and that's why law right. enforcement mm -hmm. and and the criminal uh, court system it has to play an important role they have to be informed mm -hmm. they have to be knowledgeable and they have to be proactive in trying to help and and and, and Kinsey have you found that to be you know pretty pretty much of the the rule that you've got to get law enforcement involved Yes. Um, once we, you know, we've had really great success with local law enforcement and getting them on board was um, 
exciting because what we've noticed is the women are starting to trust them. They're starting to be more vulnerable and open up about what's really going on, um, why they're on the streets, who they're working for. You know, it's a myth to think mm. a girl is out there selling herself. Um, the girls on the streets locally who are out there selling themselves, they'll get um, beaten up, and I'm talking um, horrific beatings. Uh, mm. Their heads are getting scalped. I mean, terrible things are happening to them that we're witnessing and they're telling us, you know, that it, it's for drugs. They can't get drugs without bringing back money after mm. having um, dates is what they call it, but sex. And so getting that front line and getting law enforcement now, it's amazing. Anytime they have contact with these women, they're telling them about uh, sale of freedom or mm. other organizations that are working with us and that offer safe services for them. Um, also, I liked what you said about the courts. Um, mm. The first thing I noticed when I started working with this population was when they're going in for solicitation charges, they're put in the same room as the pimps, as the drug dealers. And so if they don't so know... So they can feel intimidated. <laughs> they can feel intimidated, but they're also prey. You know, they're coming in and they're saying, oh, there's one, there's one, there's one. And I'm sitting mm. there like, and it's all public. It's their name. It's where they're staying. Mm -hmm. It's their age. And it's that they were just um, had a solicitation charge, which, you know, that shows that they're a prostitute. Mm -hmm. So um, really getting the court systems on board and getting the prosecutors the background to understand who we're dealing with, to get the courts to actually put them in separate rooms and those types of things is so important. And that's something our society as a whole has not caught on to yet. And, and you know, it seems Seems like a very simple change in process and procedure. It does. You know, to have somebody, you know, who are, or young women who are there who are the, probably the most at their most vulnerable, mm -hmm. and have them there with per perhaps uh, hardened criminals who are looking them at them as you said prey. Mm -hmm. You know, to be able to separate them seems like a you know like a, a really logical uh, step in the right direction. I think it's not thought about. Connie and I were at a meeting where. Um, we brought this up and they said, oh my gosh, we never even thought of that. Mm. And so the lawyer said, "We," and one of them started laughing because she said, I can't believe this is so simple. And um, it was like a laugh of like, oh, how embarrassing. Mm. You know, we, we never thought about it. But I think that's also because there's been a shift. There was no compassion for this population because that's this a good population. Point. That's a very good point. Yeah. I mean, I have friends that are in the sheriff's, you know, department and they say, Elizabeth, what are you talking about? This is the most belligerent population. They spit on us. They hit us with their stiletto. What are you talking about? So it was having that education piece come in that you are seeing the product right. of a child that was abused, that right. ran away, and has been sold underground as a child sex slave for seven years. Now when they're 19 or 20, yeah, they look hardened. Mm. Yeah, they don't want to hear it from you because mm. where was anyone to protect them earlier? And, and that's a that's an excellent point. So you know that shift in 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 how one mm -hmm. perceives that population has got to be a critical part of the equation in how to try to solve this. Because as we said, partnerships are are invaluable. But if you're looking at this, well, that's just another criminal. That's just right. another you know bad person who's making bad choices. Yep. But if you understand the context of how that is happening. Happening, mm -hmm. then that partnership becomes a little bit stronger and then you kind of realize that perhaps instead of just looking at it as a criminal you're looking at it as a victim. Right. It's been a paradigm shift mm. because one of the guys in law enforcement he goes oh my gosh he said you guys can solve what you're talking about is the problem mm. we're having with prostitution like this is just the symptom right and you're dealing with all this he goes you should have made a bumper sticker years ago that said <laughs> human trafficking now equals prostitution he said and we would have all figured out we could work together yeah so and like education to bumper sticker to that what? <laughs> what, because what child wakes up and says oh when I grew up I'm gonna be a prostitute mm. Mm -hmm. would you no. Do that ever and be your dream? I think that's a, you know an excellent point. I think you know by by focusing and enlightening this community and your partners, whether it's law enforcement or the court system or government, you know, into the beginnings, the origins of these conditions, these mm -hmm. social ills, right. then you can begin to try to solve that. And I think that's an initial you know step in the right direction. And I think you know across the 
the spectrum, government is starting to realize that. I know Governor Scott yes. has recognized uh, sale of freedom as being a vital part of, okay. of solving this issue. Uh, Attorney General Pam Bondi mm -hmm. has taken on human trafficking as, as a serious issue that you know she's bringing the full weight of the Attorney General's office to try to okay. solve this issue. So you are making considerable strides, and to be recognized by the you know the state of Florida as being a significant you know uh, uh, contribution to solving these ills, it's got to be you know, wonderful for you. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool, <laughs> yeah, that's very, very much so. And you know, and there are many other organizations throughout the state, mm -hmm. throughout the region, throughout you know, the nation that do things, but here in our community, you know, Sarasota, Manatee, when you look at the, you know, the condition and the proliferation of, of these type of situations, how are we best going to solve it? What can we do as a community, as individuals, as government and law enforcement? Those are the key things that, mm -hmm. that you're helping to try to you know, work towards. And I want to go to Connie for a moment, if I may, because as you identify these uh, young women and, 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 and individuals that have been abused and, and you know, you, you're offering you know, that help and resources that are out there, what are those steps that you take to bring them in, to show them, and, and, and to help them? How do you begin that process? Well, it really depends on how they come to us and, and how do I meet them. So if I'm meeting them in a foster care setting, a group home setting, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Department of Juvenile Justice, mm -hmm. um, they're unfortunately incarcerated, then it's first just we just sit down and have a conversation. And part of that conversation, though, is sharing very briefly that I'm a survivor and, and like in two sentences, what does that mean, and make that immediate connection because right away it's like you get it. You know, especially when I'll just do this really quickly, but when I share, you know, I'm a survivor of over 14 years of incest and four years of sex trafficking by our serial sex offender dad that also used, mm. also was my pimp. Well, I just hit so many little key components with an, a young survivor because usually it's a parent that sexually abused them. A lot of times it's a parent that has pimped them out or a family member. Mm. So right there, there's that connection Yes. And when you make that connection, they're like, whoa, you get it? And then you start having a conversation of, okay, what really happened? Mm. And let's like talk about it. But for me, when I speak with them, it's also about, sweetie, you made a choice. Okay, so you might have made a choice to go on the street. You made a choice to run away from home. What drove you to that choice? It's what happened to you before. And now what are we going to do about it? So whether you're incarcerated or not, you know, whether you're in foster care, it's, let's move on. Let's give you some tools. They laugh at me because I give them tools in their little tool belt. Good you know, for you. Yeah, and it's so that one day they can pull that out. So if a pimp comes next to them again, they know who to call, the 888 number, the 911 number, to call us, to call some of the other organizations that we collaborate with. But it's conversation and it's, you are a human being mm. and you have a right to be a human being. Well, and, and, and again, you know, being able to share, you know, your, your story with them gives them hope. And I think, and, and, and I would suggest that, that a lot of people in these in conditions, they feel hopeless. Yes. There is nothing for them to aspire to except that condition that they're in. Mm -hmm. But being able to uh, converse with you and, and you being able to understand them, you give them that hope that they can change their situation. A lot and of I think that's a key component. Yeah, because a lot of the hopelessness comes with, well, I've been doing drugs. Am I going to continue to do drugs? I've been having sex. I have no idea what a relationship is. You mean I could really figure that out and one day have a family of my own, have children of my own. I quit school. You mean I could actually go back to school? Mm -hmm. I could actually end up having a master's. I could have a doctorate. You know, just giving them like those tools of, look, just because whatever happened does not identify you. Mm -hmm. You know, the world is totally open to you. What are we going to do with that now? And, and, and I think the, you know, that, that, uh, that hope, those tools that you give to these people uh, that have come there feeling d in despair and feeling hopeless gives them that opportunity to see beyond their immediate uh, circum set of circumstances. And congratulations for doing that. And you, Thank you. Even if you help just one person, that's got to be a significant feeling of, of contribution. But you know, the many people that you continue to help really makes a significant difference in, in this community. But I want to kind of move on to here because there's so much that you're doing and so much that you're involved with. Uh, but 
as I mentioned at the very beginning, you need partners. You need a community to be that. And Elizabeth, I'd like for you to take a, a moment or two to talk a little bit about how this community can help you in your efforts uh, to combat this, this dreadful condition. Mm -hmm. It does take a community, and that, that's why when I think that that mentor organization came in from Atlanta mm -hmm. and we gathered everybody together, they said we can't do it without everybody. It's mm -hmm. not, because sometimes just a faith community will try to do it, or sometimes they think it's a social uh, law, right. a legal system, right. and we all have to come together. So the education piece is huge. So probably the biggest way people can partner with us right now are avenues like what you're doing, saying I want to help you with this show, I want to get the word out there, I want awareness. Because mm -hmm. people could do something as simple as open their home, and on our website there's a tab that says Party with a Purpose. Mm -hmm. They invite their friends over, they could have one of us come to share, or one of our speakers bureau, or they mm -hmm. pop in a DVD to get the message out there. So you're continuing creating that sense of awareness yeah. in the community. Because even people see a headline, or they'll hear a sound bite or something, to know the full scope and the impact of how this affects a community yeah is important. Hear a story. Yeah, Once they exactly. hear one story, like one girl that we work with, what her story was and how tremendous the outcome's looking now, mm -hmm. people want to help. But only once they understand it will they turn their head and do something. Mm -hmm. And then it, it's unlimited. I mean, we need people in every way, shape, or form. We have doctors that say, do you need someone to come to the house to do a house call if you have a situation that you can't get someone in? Private professionals lending their services pro bono mm -hmm. is tremendous. Any attorney that wants to help, sometime a woman will come to our care mm -hmm. and she will have someone, you know, she had a baby years ago, but she couldn't right. keep it. There's so many situations, whether it's women that just love to clean and they know these girls have no clue how to clean a house and they do the basics of how do you really clean a fridge? You know, there are so many elements that there's not one person in the community mm -hmm. that does not have value to bring to our program. And can contribute in some manner Absolutely. or fashion yeah. to do that, whether it's a professional, mm -hmm. Or, or you know, a doctor, an attorney. Yeah. But in the bigger picture, too, you need to create things within the school system to know that you know abuse at any level or in any situation is not to be tolerated. Correct. So it's kind of that preventive thing. So I can see you know, how sale of freedom can be such a valuable tool to outreach you know, to the school system to right. say, hey, listen, if you know or have a victim or if you know someone right. in your, your friend circle that you know, is under these conditions, this is what you need to do. Right. No one, no one should be subjected to have that kind of abuse no. ever. And I think by creating more of a sense of awareness, so within the school system, within the judicial system, I would also think within the medical profession, mm -hmm. because you would, as uh, Kinsey mentioned, there's some of these women that are beaten up and, 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 and tortured, and you know the medical profession needs to be knowledgeable enough to say, hey, listen, this needs to... Uh, right to be reported. So there's a wide variety of organizations. A business yeah. community, I would think, would be valuable. We've been speaking a lot at Rotary and Kiwanis Clubs. And right. People are shy, and it's so funny. Every time we speak, you always have someone go, I'm going to go home and prove that these stats are wrong. No one wants to believe it. It's too hard for them to hear. Mm -hmm. But the ones that are able to hear, because not everybody's able to hear, but once they are, there's movement. It's been fun. I've been getting calls from doctors, from Rotary Clubs and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But Connie's speaking on a panel with Pam Bondi to the medical community coming up soon. Uh, that's true. We've taped uh, the Attorney General on a couple of different mm -hmm. occasions, most recently at the Law Day here in Manatee County. Mm -hmm. And she made a specific point of saying that during her tenure that the human trafficking, sexual slavery is not going to be tolerated. They're going after this at every level, you know, to, to kind of make sure that this is not going to be tolerated and prosecute the people that are taking advantage of these poor young, young people. Right. So when, do, when does your, uh, will your uh, session with the um, Attorney General happen? Oh, shoot. <laughs> it's coming Let's just say coming. I, I have to do so many events. Yeah. It's, I believe it's August the 25th, and it's in Flor It's in Tampa, actually, and we're um, piggybacking with Florida Medical, mm -hmm. their foundation, and WUSF, PBS, and so they're doing a human trafficking forum. Excellent. And, yeah. and I think that, you know, again, will create the, the awareness mm -hmm. uh, that's really needed out there because, you know, this, this, this whole thing with, you know, sexual abuse, sexual uh, slavery, it's, it's that type of thing that's under the radar. Right. It's that thing that's, you know, it's those dirty little secrets that are kept. And then by the time that they uh, get to the condition where people run away or they're beaten or they end up in jail, Sometimes it's a little too late. Right. So you need to be, you're the kind of that proactive to create yeah. that sense of, you know, listen, we can help at this time. 
Absolutely. I was at Girls Inc. yesterday. Mm -hmm. I was invited to do their lunch buddies where they bring in a professional to meet with the girls. And I was going through the different tables of girls and I was sharing what happens, what I do and you know what the root is. And I said, you know, one out of three girls. And I said, so around this table, and it was just interesting because now we're almost mm. all trained to see when, you know, an eyes go down or they look around. Mm. And a few girls afterwards asked for my card, if they could call me. Good and it's and we're leading our prevention program um, in Girls Inc. in the fall. So Good Connie's heading up a pre prevention program that she could Good share more about that's, you know, proven to decrease these girls that are at risk from being full boat exploited and to lower the chance almost 90 percent. And I think that's a wonderful thing. I mean, if you can lower the risk, you know, by whatever percentage, you know, you're saving lives, you're saving people. Mm -hmm. So what is, what is the, the, the uh, partnership that you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Connie, Connie, talk to us a little bit about well, we that. We have a prevention program. It's mainly for girls 12 to 17 years old that are at high risk. It's really supposed to be if they've already been exploited, have been sexually abused, and so that, that puts them at a higher risk. Mm -hmm. But again, if one in three girls are at risk <laughs> being sexually be violated everywhere. by the time they're 18 in my personal opinion every single one of our girls is at risk and it's a 10 week one and a half hour program mm -hmm. it's a survivor led program so you have to be a survivor to go out and to facilitate this program mm -hmm. and it just takes them through what are the basics of what sex trafficking and exploitation looks like what's pornography and how is pornography a route to it sexual abuse and how is that a route and the mm -hmm. entire time that we're having these conversations over a course of 10 weeks it's about, okay, you made choices in your life. Mm -hmm. This is now your life. You make new choices. Doesn't matter what happened. What a, what a great. Yeah, what happened mm -hmm. before. And, and you have to constantly instill that, almost like every other sentence I feel like, you know, I'm saying that to them because I want them to get that. I don't want them to Important. identify yeah. with, you know, so I come from an impoverished family. I come from foster care. I was sexually abused my entire life. I was beaten. I was drugged. I was in porn. Who can, you know, like, no. Sweetie, it's like time to like step up and move forward. So we take them so through the whole. So it's a new day. It's, it's a, a new, new day. day. And you know, and what do drugs look like? And what came first? Did the drugs come first? Did being exploited come first? Mm -hmm. And then does that really matter at the end of the day? No. no. And then by the time we're done, it's really, again, my little toolbox, a little tool belt, right? It's about giving them all these incredible tools mm -hmm. so that if they're ever faced with anything again that has to be with doing with exploitation or sexual abuse, they can pull that out. They'll know to call 911. They'll know to call Sailor Freedom or another organization. Right. They'll know to call the 888-377-888 number. Or, tell or they're able to recognize, like right. one of my girls at the last group, um, at our last leadership, said to me, you know, Ms. Rose or Miss Connie, I really sat the whole time going, oh, yeah, really, like this isn't me, because she didn't want to buy in that she really was a victim, a survivor of being exploited. And she said, but you know, at school yesterday with my girlfriend, I pulled out one of my tools, oh, out yeah. of my tool belt. And she said, because you know why? Because she came in with a new cell phone, a Gucci handbag, and brand new shoes, and I knew there was no way she got them, because she's my roommate in foster care. Mm -hmm. And she said, okay, who's that boyfriend? You know, we got to call Miss Connie. Mm. Mm. That was huge. That's huge. Yeah. That's, that's, and, and, and again, you know, hats off to you and to all of you, you know, for taking this up to do that. And you know, when you meet with these women one to, one on one, and you're able to say, hey, listen, you know, we can help. Mm. We can make a difference because of the situation that's happened to you in the past. It doesn't define you. It's mm. not who you are. It's what you want to become, mm -hmm. and I think what you're doing is, you know, is just the 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 level of it is to help these young women, and I, I would guess young boys mm -hmm. at, at from time to time, you know, get that stigma of you know being uh, a drug or prostituted or any of these things, right. and say you we you have your whole life ahead of right. you, and to give them that hope. And, and again, uh, Kinsey, I want to go back to you for a few minutes, if I may, because you know law enforcement has got to be vital. You're growing your law enforcement uh, partners, I would think. You know, throughout the city of Bradenton, did you mention, uh, was a big partner on it. The city of Sarasota, a, a partner. Law enforcement has got to be ready to respond mm -hmm. to these type of issues. They've got to be knowledgeable about these type of issues. And are you finding that law enforcement is very receptive to this? Yes, uh, Bradenton Police, Sarasota Police, you know, right away they said, bring us your training. We want to know. Um, so training them what it looks like. And specifically, um, 
once the training happened, we do something, it's basically like a ride along, but where I go out there with them, I make contact with the women. It's a time where, um, you know, they're not looking to make arrests or things like that. We're looking to really build bridges mm -hmm. um, so that these women know we're here. Mm -hmm. I would say the two biggest things are consistency and honesty with them, just being transparent. It takes seven to eight times before they'll buy in. Mm. And so knowing this is gonna be a process. It's kind of developing that trust. It uh, is, and, and with me and law enforcement to know, you know, I'm, I'm gonna speak good about you, I'm going to help you with your goals, and I need your help with my goals. And so um, the best thing that's happened is seeing these women's eyes light up when they see law enforcement and they need a connection. And now they're not afraid, they're not running from them. They're saying, oh my gosh, uh, this is happening. Mm -hmm. They're giving them information and they're really, um, you know, we've, we've actually seen fruit in this past year. So that's been really exciting. We've had girls come into residential. We've had girls come into our mentorship program. Mm -hmm. um, they ask for us when they're in the jail. They mm -hmm. ask the um, deputies and everyone working, you know, we want to talk to Sailor Freedom or other partners we're working with. Good we point. work closely with Detox. And so um, they're just building those relationships. It's just so key with them. Well, I would think, you know, being you know law enforcement and as closely connected as you are, mm -hmm. I mean, they're the first line mm -hmm. that these uh, uh, young women will see. Mm -hmm. Either they're getting arrested or they're getting stopped or whatever. So law enforcement has to be very knowledgeable and perceptive on what the conditions these, these young people are coming from. And, and that's an important asset that you're providing them. You said, we need to look at this. Is this girl a victim? Is this girl on drugs? Is she being, uh, you know, uh, subjugated to all these different things? So your uh, knowledge of the condition of these is a valuable tool, if, we can, if I can borrow Connie's toolbox thing for a moment, <laughs> is an important tool for law enforcement in that first line because they're the first people they're going to run into. Mm -hmm. I think the, a change that's happened is they used to um, arrest and not talk to them. Mm -hmm. And now they're seeing them as, oh, they are doing something illegal. They might mm -hmm. be on drugs mm -hmm. because of um, being exploited. Um, usually that's the first tactic is let's start doing drugs together with a pimp or trafficker. And then that's how they're keeping them hooked is because they need those drugs. They also don't want to think about the horrific things that have happened to them. That's, so, that's probably a, a huge part of it. Right, when they sit in jail and they sober up and they start to think about what's happened to them over and over and over, they're running back to the drugs, they're running back to the streets because that's all they know. That's what they feel comfortable with. So now that the police are really starting to understand this process and how we break that cycle, they don't get as frustrated, they don't get upset. They're like, okay, this is all right. part of it. Right. We're getting closer. Um, also, they're listening. They're listening to their stories. They're listening to why they're out there. We had a girl um, out on the streets and she said, um, I, I just don't want counseling. And I said, oh, I said, why don't you want counseling? And she said, because my brother and I were both sexually abused by my stepfather. And that's how she got out on the streets and her and her brother were both selling themselves. And she said, because um, as soon as my brother got counseling, he killed himself. Mm -hmm. And so she had this fear of help. And so really understanding that, the police were like, oh. So really they're just starting to listen and mm -hmm. understand this vulnerable population. And now um, anytime they have a lead on someone, they're calling us they're saying we've got someone we want you to meet with they're opening up those doors mm. and the women are um, saying huh you're everywhere I am you're on the streets you're with the police you're in jail so all the support groups that Sailor Freedom has set up is really starting to make an impact because they're starting to see us everywhere they go and, and you know to, to use the thing you're you're getting your credentials, so to speak because <laughs> you're actually there you you you, you see them you're in the same areas that they're in. Mm -hmm. So they know that you're genuinely, genuinely interested in their well-being. Yes. And, and if I could just put in a word for, you know, the Braden and Police Department, knowing uh, Deputy Chief Merriman, and he's very involved and he's you know, very a supportive. conscientious a a individual. Mm -hmm. and, and I would suggest as well that, you know, the police, you know, and, and you know, crimes like, you know, prostitution and things like that, they're more interested in you know the serious issues that are facing whether it's you know, people who are selling drugs or selling young young women those are the things so they want to help as well and exactly. I think that's a key thing for you to have these partnerships 
Elizabeth, I want to talk for you for a minute because we we briefly touched on you know about the community involvement, mm -hmm. but you are not only looking at prevention, you're looking at outreach mm -hmm. to the community, you're looking about the services and resources that you have. But Sale of Freedom is interested in a bigger picture as well, mm -hmm. in creating this kind of community network mm -hmm. of outreach and involvement that hopefully down the year, you're not as busy as you are today. <laughs> and, and I would suggest that's the, all of yours goal, perhaps. It's so our goal, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But, and so how, that community network being, right. you know, Sarasota, Manatee, mm -hmm. government, you know, law enforcement, judicial, all of those things coming together. And you run a facility as well. So, mm -hmm. I mean, those are all of the many things that you're working with right now. Right, right. We really hope that we start, we, I feel like we already are, but to grow, to become positioned as a solution center. Mm. That we're a place that people come for answers, for solutions, that not only can a girl come here to find her way back, but law enforcement checks in with us. They definitely use us as a resource. And we have a meeting with um, Ed Brodsky's office next week mm -hmm. where they want to look at the big judicial system and making mm -hmm. this, you know, like how well, there's drug court and teen court. Right. You know, setting up some bigger structures so that exactly. it gets easier to navigate the system. Exactly. Because right now, you know, it's a lot of education. Mm -hmm. We're growing compassion. But as people are getting it, more turning towards us and saying, okay, we get it. Let's make this work. How can we put together a system that's going to be more productive? And sustainable. And sustainable. Absolutely. And that's a, that, that would be a key thing because as you're looking at solving the thing and Connie's working with these young women and outreaching to them, you have to be able to sustain not only the program and resources that you have, but to be able to say, hey, listen, we, can, we want to do more. Right, and that's a, that. That would uh, see part of that strategic right. you know, positioning that you right. would like to have. We have about 180 volunteers in our system right now. It's tremendous. It's amazing, and we're really getting. We just got a new software, so we get better at utilizing. Yeah, for, that's <laughs> for those of you that have, have signed up and are waiting for a call, but we're we're starting to use a lot more people because what we're realizing now yeah. is there are some that they just are great going out to talking to corporate corporations sure. and helping us get sponsorships. We have a 5K coming up, we have a vision night coming up. Excellent. Publix out on Longboat Key just gave us a check yesterday for 500 to be a partner in one, one of the race Excellent. coming up. So some people in the community, they're like, I'll just go out there and be an awareness. I'll be an advocate for you to the community. Others, we need people to come in and lead groups in the home. So mm -hmm. now that the girls, in the beginning, they, you know, it takes a while for them to come in and rest. That SALA stage is right. vital. And now they're needing more and more meat. So now is the time that the community, those um, social workers out there, the ones that have said, I want to come in and lead a group. I want to help with one thing. Right. We need more and more now. And, and I would suggest to you that you know when the when Connie sees those uh, young women come off the street, they do. They need a, a moment away from the oh, yeah. fear and the anxiety and the stress of of being out there. And as they reflect, but as their growth develops, you need to send them to school. You need to provide for them. So there's, that's a whole other infrastructure that's important. Yeah. And people can support that by, right. you know, by getting in touch with right. you and saying, listen, I need to help in, in some capacity. We have a textbook perfect story that I love to share because it's the heart of what we do. And so one of the girls that came into our program, she was the first to come into our residential care. And she had come through a product of foster care and family abuse and just every which way she turned, she was abused. At 18, at that point, she had nowhere to go. She had a girlfriend, because they don't really want to stay in the foster care system. Mm. They did this extended thing right, now, right, but right. they don't, you know, nothing good happened. They mm. haven't seen good of it. And so this girl had a girlfriend that called her and said, I met these guys, they have a great house, they'll help take care of us, we could live there. And this girl had managed, she's one of the few that come, came in with her high school diploma. Because we do believe if you can survive out there on the streets, mm. you are brilliant. These girls are resilient, they know how to make it. So she um, went to live in this house with these guys, first few weeks. So coming to Sela is a little indicative of the grooming stage with these guys, because mm -hmm. first two to four weeks, these guys are like, oh yeah, we'll take care of you. And then after the first few weeks, they said, you know what, we have a buddy that owns a strip club. We're gonna need you girls to start dancing. We just need a little more money. It's costing more than we thought. So mm -hmm. she's like, oh, here I go again. So she had to start dancing. And then after that, they're like, you know what, a little more cash, that you have to do some backroom work and a little sex on the side. 
And I think that's a myth too. People don't understand all the dynamics mm. of strip clubs and why some of these girls are forced to be there. It's not all choice. Um, and this girl finally, she tried to commit suicide. Mm. And she was Baker acted. And by the end of it, she had nowhere to go because she had no addictions. And a lot of programs, you have to have some addiction. Right. And a social worker on one of her last days came to her and said, there's a new program. This was a year ago fall. And it's called Sale of Freedom. The only prerequisite is sexual exploitation or abuse. You qualify. Yeah. And she goes, do you think they'll take me? And when she called for her intake, our intake counselor was the girl that was, um, her, one of her earlier jobs was at a home for pregnant teenagers. Uh -huh. This girl at around 13, 14 had given up a baby because of a rape. Mm. And this counselor walked her through that. So when she called for intake, our counselor goes, oh, do you recognize who I am? It's Allie. Uh, and the girl goes, can I come live with you? Uh, and so she came in and her goal was college. That's why she went to live with those guys. They'll help me pay for good college. For her. And good now for her. Um, Gulf Coast Community Foundation, mm -hmm. as well as um, some other donors have given her a scholarship to begin Very good. college. She starts in yeah. about a week or so. And, and, and how exciting, yeah. how exciting. And a foster care kid can't get um, their driver's license. Right, exactly. So right now we have a Gulf Coast Gives project. You know that's trying to be changed. But <laughs> I'm you know, hoping that's, that's changed, yeah. yeah. But I, I, I think you're right. What a rewarding story. I mean, it's a tragedy that keeps kind of unfolding, but at the same time, you're there at the end of the day to say, we can help. And um, I think that's critical. And now, it's amazing to look at them. She's it it is. And, and it's got to be for all of you, for all of you, how rewarding to see that one individual, that one person just bloom and nurture and turn the corner. And that's got to be, for each one of you, just kind of a rewarding moment each and every day. Now, we're kind of winding down a little bit, and I wanted to go around the table, but before we begin, you have an advisory board, which I think, you know, we should know more about. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, a board kind of, you know, is, is an important part of any organization. So tell us a little bit about your advisory board and, and some of the individuals that, mm -hmm. and organizations that play a vital part. Well, we have a great board of directors as well as advisory board. Oh, well, our advisory board, board. Our advisory board has about 16, 17 people on it well, that's because good truly size. they're our subject matter experts because mm. our staff is small. We don't want to run up a lot of costs on staff. So we have experts, whether they're attorneys, um, communications experts. Gotcha. One of the um, captains in the police force is on our advisory board. Oh, good. So we get a lot of direction on a day-to-day -day basis from our advisory board. And our chairman of our board of directors is Bill Russell. He is the CEO of the Housing Authority, mm -hmm. which is key because as we expand here and we're looking to move our girls to independent living, he's familiar they with need, Section 8, how to help you know move things. Right. Yeah, so and, great. And, and I think that you know an advisory board and, and an engaged and informed board of directors helps you, know, you kind of foster that kind of uh, understanding in the community as well mm -hmm. because they're, they're your best uh, partners. Right, exactly. So. So I want to wind down a little bit here, and, and I want to go around the table and, and, and kind of get you know, some final remarks. But before I begin that, this is not the only program that we're going to do with Sale of Freedom. And that's one thing that I want you know, Elizabeth to talk about, because we're going to have some subsequent programs talking with not only some of the resource providers that you have, mm -hmm. but also some of the success stories that you've accomplished. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be hosting those, correct? <laughs> yes, I am. Yes, we are. <laughs> yes, the three of you. So it'll be we your are. little version, which I think is important because one of the things that we talked about was that sustainability right. of keeping that awareness and kind of sense of, of community out there right. uh, continuously. So we look forward to having you back for future programs. You won't need me anymore because uh, the three of you can more than handle <laughs> this. But, you know, to continue uh, reach out and explore the different aspects of what Sale of Freedom continues to do. Right. And, you know, I, I, we really welcome that. And I think it would be a wonderful opportunity for this community in Sarasota and Manatee to understand the full gamut and, and, and the impact that you continue to have. Right. What I think is funny is that somebody that came on our team, she said, a lot of times I get involved in not-for-profits and it's like, helping them to not drown or, you know, we're sort of a slow sinking boat. Can you help us? She goes, ever since I've met you, it's like, there goes the speedboat. <laughs> and I think that having an ongoing, that's, very good. that's, very that's very a good. good picture. Well, I think that's good. And we're going to help and METV is going to help in any capacity that we Thank can you. to try to get that message out because I think it's not only an important message, it's one that this community really deserves to know more about. Right. So we look forward to the future programs down the road. Uh, yeah. But before we end today, I want to start with Connie, if I may. And, and again, 
Connie, hats off to you, you know, because you're, you're that one individual that, that's that initial contact with a lot of the young people that come into your care under your guidance. And, you know, as, as they sit there and you look across from them and they, you see their, and you understand kind of what they've been through, um, you're that one light in the darkness, that outreached hand that's trying to help. And it's got to be, you know, such a, at the same time, very difficult but very rewarding position. It's incredibly rewarding. As I, as I said earlier, it's, it's an honor to be able to walk alongside of them and watch when that light goes off. You know, I brought um, a young girl down from the Washington, D.C. area, and she's been with us since December. And when she walked in, I mean, and I totally got everything she wouldn't do. She wouldn't mm. sleep on a bed because of what happened on the bed. Mm. Um, she had to sleep on the floor in a sleeping bag. And you know now she sleeps on her bed, under the covers, um, can have lights on, can now have conversations with men. She went riding on a, a motorcycle with one of our board members' husbands. You know, I mean, I think I cry every time I think about it because that's the success stories you know, that we want. Right. But more importantly, it's just when you walk alongside them and you just really see that, that there is a difference in their lives. And, you know, whether it's through our prevention program, you know, I spoke at a high school not long ago, 375 juniors and seniors, 28 came forward. Hmm. Now, it wasn't all about, you know, being exploited, but there was domestic violence, drug abuse, addiction to pornography, hmm. who was um, dating, I mean, who was raping their girlfriends. Hmm. And then there were cases of sexual exploitation. Hmm. That was huge. And so huge. just working with these kids and just letting them know that, you know, come forward. Elizabeth took cards from two girls yesterday, you know, and then let us sit down and let's have that conversation with you of, okay, now what's this going to look like and what can we do to help you move forward? And, and to have somebody there that not only understands but mm -hmm. really has the tools and, and, and the ability to help has, has got to be tremendous. And, and hats off to you, Connie, for, you. for doing that. And I just want to say, you know, because everyone wants to know stats, so just very quickly. Stats doesn't, don't matter mm. because it's one. It's like you said before. It's one, it's one person, one, one child. Time. And so if you make a difference with one person, one child, or if it's one child that's being sexually abused or exploited, it's one too That's many. That's one too many, one right, too exactly, many. yes. And, and again, Connie, congratulations for, the, for not only the, the, the extent of work, but the quality of work that you continue to help the, these young people with. Thank you. Yep. Kinsey, you know, you're such a vital part of what uh, Sale of Freedom continues to do because you're helping law enforcement identify ways that they can help people how we can uh, instruct our police officers and, uh, into knowing that these are victims. That, that's got to be a valuable lesson for everyone to learn. And knowing that you're working with law enforcement, it's got it, to it's, it's be a great tool for sale of freedom. Yes, it is. It's been amazing. Uh, I would say in closing thoughts that you know, we, we still would like to get more law enforcement to buy into what's happening and so really understanding it is a community effort and that the solution cannot be jail mm -hmm. um, we can't afford it and it's not a solution and so we've really got to all buy into um, us coming together as a community I would also say um, to the community that the things that you know we need tips and so a lot of times we'll get calls from people um, and they trust SALA or the human trafficking hotline um, to call in those tips. We've got a lot of saunas, massage parlors in Mantee County mm. um, all over the place. And so mm. if you see something suspicious, to make sure and call the 188-3737-888 um, hotline and turn those tips in. Don't stop, don't try to do your own investigation, but um, to just really be aware. And mm -hmm. same for, um, this is a runaway destination state. It, it very much is sunshine, beaches, you know, yes. kids are, young people are gonna flock down here. And unfortunately, there's gonna be predators here waiting to take advantage of those young people. Yeah, so ask questions, you know, ask 
what's your name or who are you staying with? Ask the simple questions and turn that stuff in. Um, a lot of times they're, we call it a wheel that they're on and they, they know how to answer the questions. And if you just keep asking, um, one girl said she lived in Bradenton. So when I started asking, she, we were in Sarasota. When I started asking her questions about Bradenton, she had no idea what I was talking about. Mm. So I knew something was off. Um, but to call and report that and be a part of the solution is... Uh, and again, you know, great, great work that you're doing and a continued uh, success with outreaching to law enforcement. And, you know, there's a law enforcement is real vital to this community. And I think your continued efforts, you're just going to expand that, you know, law enforcement community wanting to be a part of, of, of the success that you've already had. Yes. So I, I think it's really important that law enforcement work very closely with Sale of Freedom mm -hmm. in order to come to, you know, great solutions. So Elizabeth, again, I want to thank you and Kinsey and Connie for participating. And I want to give you the last word. It's a wonderful organization. You've come very far in a, in a very short period of time. <laughs> and I think it's due to not only the quality and the expertise, but also the commitment mm -hmm. and dedication that, that all of you bring to this. Right. Um, but the mission is not over. It, I mean, it's going to be an ongoing thing. You know, there right. exists in the, in, in the world you know, evil, and people are going to take advantage of other people, right. the most vulnerable uh, in our community. That's the people that... Got, get, get taken advantage of the most vulnerable. Right. So what do you want this community to know about Sale of Freedom and how they can help? I would say that we have not yet seen a normal. It is changing and growing and things are happening mm -hmm. so quickly that we would love for them to stay informed. We would love them to go to our website. There's so much information there. Mm -hmm. But if they can go and hit the sign up for our newsletter, that would allow us to speak to them directly once a month. We won't inundate them, mm -hmm. but the many, many changes. Like for example, we just bought this new property and it has Good a 2,800 square foot barn on it that Craig Holiday and the Holiday Group and another architect are getting involved and they're gonna head up the community in transforming this barn oh, into a community center. Very, what a great for idea. For our girls, an activity center. So we need a ton of people involved, but by signing up for our newsletter, you're not gonna miss a thing because well, it we're changes gonna weekly. That, <laughs> we're gonna have that information about how they can mm -hmm. contact and we're also gonna have the human trafficking uh, hotline up as well. So mm -hmm. you can, people can you know continue to find out more information about that. Yeah. And we're gonna welcome you back at any time uh, Elizabeth and Kinsey and Connie to talk about this because this is an important issue. This issue, you know, even though we wish it would, is not going to go away. Right. And so it's going to take women like you and a community, you know, to come together to kind of find, you know, really sustainable solutions right. to this situation. But again, I have to take, uh, uh, this community should take its hat off to you for doing yeah. so much uh, uh, in this short period of time that Sale of Freedom has been doing be recognized by the governor. You have Pam Bondi, a discussion uh, coming up in the next few weeks. So we welcome you back, and uh, I thank you very much for contributing so much to this program. Elizabeth, if people want to find out, how, what, uh, what's the website? SalahFreedom.com, S-E-L-A-H, Freedom.com. All right. Elizabeth, thank you so much Let's for start. participating. Kinsey and Connie, thank you for joining us on this program. And thank you for joining us on this special report. If you want to find out additional information about Sale of Freedom or find out about the human trafficking, go to the websites that are up on the screen and you'll find out more. Thank you for joining us. I'm Charles Clapsaddle for METV.